Grab her hand. Me. What? Jesus healed me from my mouth. What did you do? I prayed to God and it made me feel better. Wow, and then what happened? And then what happened? I feel better. <laughs> so what, what did you, you say? I said, Gorgeous man, you pray that you get my mouth better and me. And just stay in. That's what I said, and then he healed me. He healed me. He healed me. So what's up? And so what do you say? How are you? How are you? Thank you, God. 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 Oh, good girl. I'm so, I'm so happy for you. I'm happy with joy. I'm happy with joy. I'm happy with joy. I love you, God. <laughs> happy health. And all this time, I thought I was saying it right. Hallelujah. And it's wrong. It's pop it up there. Pop it up there, Annalise. Hallelujah. You got it? Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay, so we're going to say that. Okay, this today is a sermon about joy. So it is legal to smile in church, okay? And we're going to yell out this word, okay? One, two, three. Hallelujah. Oh, that sounded good. Let's do it again. Hallelujah. Every time you see that up there, I expect that we'll do that. Hallelujah, okay? <laughs> what is joy? What is joy? Is it missing in so many lives today, especially in those that don't know Jesus? But I'm telling you something, for us that do know Jesus, that should be our trademark, shouldn't it? That we are full of joy. It should be a telltale sign that we're a Christian, that we're full of joy. You know what? It's a second fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, but joy is number two. Joy is important. Joy is important in our life. The Greek word for joy is kara, which actually means to celebrate, to of enjoyment and bliss. One of the first verses that I think of when I teach on joy is where Ezra was uh, reading the law and teaching the people, and they began to recognize their sin and grieve for what they had done. And it is right when we recognize our sin to grieve and to understand how sin is bad, how awful it is. But Ezra reminded them this. He says, repent, do that, don't forget that. Repent, then lift your hands and worship. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when we recognize we've done wrong, repent, we repent over it, and then we lift our hands in worship, and we let the joy of the Lord become our strength. Ruth Calkin writes this, Dear God, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your child. You ever felt that way? Just not worthy, I'm not worthy. But God says this, Child, I know, I know, but my son is forever worthy to be called your Savior. See, joy is understanding who we are and who we're not, and then understanding who he is and who we are because of who he is. Do you understand that? That should give us all kinds of joy. Joy is having a face to face encounter with God. And when we have a face to face encounter with God, we need to say, Hallelujah. We need to say, Hallelujah. You know, in, in, uh, in the Bible, in Luke 10, uh, the, uh, the story is told of the, uh, well, in, in some manuscripts it says 70, and some it says 72, but really, doesn't matter. The missionaries were sent out, and uh, the and 
they were so excited. They were so excited because as they did what Jesus taught them, it, the demons even came out of people. And he said, while you were ministering, Jesus says this to them, while you were ministering, I watched Satan topple until he fell suddenly from heaven like lightning to the ground. Now that is pretty exciting. When we begin to minister and we see that happening and we should be excited. But he goes on to say, however... Your real source of joy isn't merely that these spirits submit to your authority, but that your names are written in the journals of heaven, that you belong to God's kingdom. That's what the joy, that's where the joy comes from. And we can get all excited about the outward manifestations, and it is awesome, it is exciting, but we ought to have joy every day knowing that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That should be... A reason to say hallelujah all the time when we think about it. Number one, the reason for joy is that our names are written. Luke 10, 20, as I said, however, do not re uh, rejoice that the Spirit submits to you, but rejoice that your names are written. And then the psalmist says it this way, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And then he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You see, it is, uh, if not one external factor in our life could give us joy, not one thing going on in our, in our physical life could give us joy, we ought to have joy just by virtue that we are saved that we have salvation, that should give us joy. <laughs> Some people have a funny way of expressing joy of salvation. I was, I'm always amused by those, you know, those church signs, you know. Uh, I don't, we don't have them too much anymore. They used to, they're, you know, they'd have the little things that they'd have to go out and change the little plastic letters on, and then, then they came to digital, and, and some of them have really funny signs on them. And one is this, as you p pass this little church, be sure to plan a visit. So when at last you're carried in, God will say, who is it? Okay, the next one is a very good one. The duct tape is great, but three nails fixed everything. Isn't that cool? That was for you, Brian, because duct tape is your friend. I know. Next one is honk if you love Jesus and text while you're driving if you want to meet him quickly. <laughs> I love this one. Tweet others the way you want to be tweeted. <laughs> That's good. Sorry, I'm, at least I'm amused. <laughs> uh, then uh, another one, Moses was the first person with a tablet to download data from the cloud. <laughs> That's pretty good. He was pretty progressive, wasn't he? <laughs> and Jesus is your get out of hell card free. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus is your get out of hell free card. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> I like this one. Too cold to keep changing the signs. Sin is bad. God is good. Come inside for the details. <laughs> Life without Jesus is like an unsharpened pencil. There is absolutely no point. Isn't that the truth? Thank goodness it doesn't work that way. Salvation is a free gift ready to be received and enjoyed by anybody who would receive it. He would that none perish. He doesn't want anybody to die. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. I get so frustrated when people say, God, God's going to send you to hell. No, he's not. He's not going to send nobody to hell. We send ourselves. He has provided a way out, and it's free. It's free. All we have to do is receive, receive that gift. And I think that deserves a big hallelujah. Number two, the catalyst for joy is discovery. Matthew 13, 44 says, A man discovered a hidden treasure, hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had to buy the land. Isn't that awesome? He found this, he found this treasure, but it wasn't his. So he went and did what he needed to do to get the money to buy the land. And he discovered the treasure. Matthew 28, 8 says, when the, woman, when the women discovered an empty tomb, they were afraid. Yet 
filled with joy. And then they went and told. Have you ever been that way? Have you ever been terrified? But inside you had that sturdy, strong joy? No? No? I mean, I, I know that sounds like totally weird, but you don't know what the next step is. You don't know what the future holds, but you have this joy inside you that's unshakable. That is what I'm talking about. Getting to that place where we don't have to know everything, every detail. We just follow the way, not ways. Not, that didn't, that didn't make sense to you. Did anybody use Waze when they drive? You know, that little app? Hello? Thank you, Jerry. A few of you. Well, it's a little, it's an app that you use that tells you how to get there, and it's called Waze. You don't follow Waze for salvation. You follow the way, the truth, and the life. Luke 1, John the Baptist, still in his mother's womb, wept for joy when he discovered the Messiah. And then Luke 2.10 says the shepherds journey long to discover this good news of great joy. That's what Jesus was called, good news of great joy. That was his name. That was his identity, joy. Discover Jesus, discover joy. It's pretty simple. Discover Jesus, discover joy. Hallelujah. Okay. I want, to, I want to show you one more video. I think that I, I found this, and it just really encapsulates what joy is in our life. Can you play that one, Annalise, please? Now, what, now what makes these biblical joy words interesting is noticing the kinds of things that bring happiness and also seeing how joy is a key theme that runs through the whole story of the Bible. Let's start with sources of joy. On page one of the Bible, God says that this world is very good. And so naturally, people find joy in beautiful and good things of life, like growing flocks or an abundant harvest on the hills. People find joy at a wedding or in their children. There's even a Hebrew proverb that compares the joy that perfume brings to your nose with the joy a good friend brings to your heart. However, human history isn't just a joy fest. The biblical story shows how we live in a world that's been corrupted by our own selfishness. It's marked by death and loss. And this is where biblical faith offers a unique perspective on joy. It's an attitude God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promise. So when the Israelites were suffering from slavery in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead them into freedom. And the first thing the Israelites did was sing for joy. Even though they were in the middle of a desert, they were vulnerable, the promised land was still far away, they rejoiced anyway. Later biblical poets looked back on this story and they remembered how the Lord caused his people to leave with joy, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. This joy in the wilderness, this was a defining moment, a way of saying that the joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. This theme appears later in Israel's story, when Israel suffered under the oppression of foreign empires. The prophet Isaiah looked for a day when God would raise up a new deliverer like Moses. That's when those redeemed by the Lord will return to Zion with glad shouts, with eternal joy crowning their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them. And while the Israelites waited, they chose joy to anticipate their future redemption. This is why it's significant that when Jesus of Nazareth was born, it was announced as good news that brings great joy. We're told that Jesus himself rejoiced and gave thanks to God his Father when he began to announce the kingdom of God. He even taught his followers the same joy in the wilderness, saying, when people reject you or persecute you for following me, rejoice, be very glad, because your reward is great in heaven. After his death and resurrection, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out and announce the good news that he was the risen king of the world. And as they did so, the early Christian communities were known for being full of joy, even when they were persecuted. Like when the Apostle Paul was sitting in a dirty Roman prison, he could say that he's chosen joy, even if he gets executed. He called this the joy of faith or joy in the Lord. He believed it was the gift of God's spirit, a sign that Jesus' presence is with you, inspiring hope in the midst of hardship. 
And when you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable in the darkest of circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that you ignore or suppress your sorrow. That's not healthy or necessary. Paul often expressed his grief about missing loved ones or losing friends or his own freedom. He called it being full of sorrow and yet rejoicing. As he acknowledged his pain, he also made a choice to trust Jesus that his loss wouldn't be the final word. This is very different from the trite advice to turn that frown upside down. Christian joy is a profound decision of faith and hope in the power of Jesus' own life and love. And that's what biblical joy is all about. If I were to ask you today, do you feel bold and confident? Maybe some of you would raise your hand. Maybe some of you are going, are you kidding? But the Bible says you're bold and confident. You are complete. When you have Jesus, you are complete. And it goes on and on and on. Jesus' opinion of you should give you great joy. Tim Cook reminds us that let your joy be in your journey, not in some distance, distant goal. When I get there, I'm going to be really happy. When I get this done, I'm going to be really, I'm just, just going to make my day. You know, I'm sorry. But we, our day ought to be made when we open our eyes and say, good morning, Lord. Not good Lord morning. You know, we need to open our eyes and say, this is going to be a good day. No matter what the circumstances are. And I know some of you are facing circumstances right now that you say, Pam, you have no idea. Well, yeah, I mean, there are circumstances, but I tell you what, the inside joy that comes from the Lord cannot be, will not be, if we don't allow them, taken away because of Jesus that lives inside us, no matter what the circumstance is. Discover who we are and then stand up, stand up, because joy is a matter of perspective. It's a matter of what you look at and how you look at it. Proverbs 15, 15 says, Everything seems to go wrong when you feel weak and depressed. But when you choose, did you get that word? When you choose to be cheerful, every day will bring you more and more joy and fullness. When you and I choose. Choose joy. Choose to focus on joy. You know people that they look at a glass of water and they say, that's half empty. And then there are those people who look at it and say, it's half full. Or you're driving down the road and you say, how's your gas? And you say, well, it's, about em- it's half empty. You know? I mean, well, I still have half a tank. <laughs> I'm doing good. You know, it depends on your perspective. It depends on my perspective. And we can train ourselves to look for things that remind us to have joy. Now, I know for some of you, this is going to be just really squirrely. And you just have to remember that I was a youth pastor for a lot of years, okay? But also know this, that how the human mind thinks, and we can get all sidetracked really easily by things going on around us and by things that aren't going right and by problems that are facing us. And sometimes we need little reminders to be joyful in the middle of our struggles. So I was thinking about things that might just remind us to have a little joy about what the Lord says to us. Um, I'm going to give you a few of these. And I just dare you to look at one of these products next week and not think about a scripture, okay? Because you're going to say, Pam, that was really squirrely. But I guarantee next week when you see one of these products, it's going to make you think about a scripture. And with that, I hope you say, God, I choose joy. Okay. Anybody use gain? Laundry detergent? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. He has used it (laughs) since I've been gone. (laughs) Sorry. Luke 9.25. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, and yet lose his own soul. Now, I just double dog dare you. Next week, if you see gain, that you don't think, what is it that I would gain the whole world but lose my soul? Hello? You never saw a hearse pulling it? You all. Yeah, that's the way it goes. 
you know. I mean, it just doesn't happen. I, don't, I, I mean, we can get all the toys we want, but I tell you what, until we come to the place to have Jesus in our heart and know that our destination is heaven and to know that I'm having joy on this side of the destination, that means joy in the journey, we're sunk. Okay, cling free. Romans 12, 9. Love must be sincere. Sincere. <laughs> Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Okay. Probably a lot of you don't use that, right? Okay. Let's, let's look at Don. I like Don. We use Don a lot. Okay. Psalm 112.4. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. Hello. Do you know what that's saying? Even in your struggles, in my struggles, in the hard times, light dawns on the righteous inside inside us joy our circumstances don't have to dictate what's going on inside us for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous then dove soap love uh, luke 3 22 and the holy spirit depend, uh, descended on him in bodily form like a dove i'm i'm sure you can come up with a lot of other scriptures for that too and a voice from heaven said you are my son whom i love and who and with you, I'm well pleased. And then we're getting ready for spring, so some of you will pull out the miracle grow. And I want you to think of this scripture, Hebrews 2, 4. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit di distributed according to his will. And last one, I love this, shout, okay? Psalm 98, 4. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, burst into jubilant song with, with music. Every time you see a bottle, of <laughs> you see a bottle of shout. Even if you're in Walmart, just break out and praise, okay? <laughs> just break out right out in Walmart. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> Somebody will carry you off, I guarantee. <laughs> and Jerry, you just tell Sandra just to tell them that it's one of our people from church. It's all okay. They're happy. They're joyful because they saw a bottle of shout. <laughs> okay. It's just reminders. I'm telling you, those may be silly to you, but you find things that you that in you to praise things that remind you that God is good even in struggles that God is good all the time and it doesn't matter what I'm going through God is still good he hasn't changed he will never change he's the same yesterday today and tomorrow he's going to be the same and you can take that to the bank because he is good so if he is good I'm good because I have him inside me and the joy his joy he went to the cross, and he said he counted it joy. You know why he counted it joy? So he could bring you and me with him. That's awesome. So for the joy, he suffered. Wow, hallelujah. You know, Paul and Silas, they went through all kinds of things. They had all kinds of hardships, but they continued to walk in joy. And I know I use this illustration a lot, but I'm... I'm picturing them in that jail cell and I'm telling you if there was ever any time to be down it was then but they chose joy they chose joy they chose to be happy they chose to sing sometimes when things are going on in my life I choose not to sing and then it sets in the pity party you know what I'm talking about? Don't look at me like I'm just a sinner up here. Okay, I mean, all of us, we, we make that choice. And then it, it's like a snowball. It just keeps going and going. But if I choose in the middle of it, Brian, we were talking just this week. I, we were driving some, somewhere after I got back with Dad, and we were going through different things that had gone on and things that were going on. And I said, you know, even right now in the middle, I'm feeling okay. Because I know God is in control. He has everything worked out. And I might say this, maybe not the way I want it, and the way I think it should, could, or ought to be, but he has it worked out. And because I'm his kid, it's going to be okay. Because you're his kid, it's going to be okay. It just depends on if I want to be sour in the middle of the journey or I want to be full of joy in the middle of the journey. And I'm telling you what, I choose joy. Every time, I choose joy. 
Stephen discovered joy even in the face of death. He was right there being stoned, and he said, do not hold this against them. Now, that's not somebody that's bitter, is it? That's somebody that knows inner peace. That's somebody who knows that he knows that he knows that God has got him in the palm of his hand. In James 1, 2, it says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking nothing. What that says to me is sometimes I'm going to go through things so that I can be complete. Uh, When I was, when we were first married, I, and we had a little lady. You, you remember Miss Walton, you know, at Grace Church. And boy, she could make bread. I'm telling you what, she could make bread. And I, I knew enough about how not to make bread that I just had her come down to the house, you know, when we were first married. And I said, Miss Walton, you got to show me how you make your bread. And uh, so I got all the, the ingredients and everything. And she uh, got to the one point and she said, Now, honey, you're going to want to skip this part because you're going to get tired. She was pretty blunt, wasn't she? Yeah, you remember her. And she said, you're going you're gonna to want to skip this part, but you can't skip this part because your bread will be terrible. I said, okay. <laughs> and it was the kneading. And she made me knead it and knead it and knead it. Now I'm thankful for those dough hooks. <laughs> oh, Miss Walton would have been in, well, she is in heaven, but she would have really been in heaven with dough hooks. <laughs> but I'm telling you, knead it, knead it, knead it, knead it. And I, I, I think about that, and I think about the pain sometimes that, that we go through in our lives and the things that, you know, when Sister Sandpaper comes up and rubs us the wrong way, you know, and, and we just want to, you know, bust them, you know, in the face, and really all God is doing is taking off our rough edges, you know, seriously. So, you know, instead of getting mad at Sister Sandpaper, say, thank you, honey. (laughs) No, she might, well, never mind. (laughs) I'm just, I have this little thing in my, well, anyway. Uh, But I'm thinking with that bread, as I knead it, knead it, knead it, and then I put it out, pinch it out, and put it and let it rise, and it, it, it's, it's nice. The texture is really nice. See, that's what happens with us when we don't despise the correction, when we don't despise the hard times. I would not be who I am without those hard struggle times. And some of them, I said, God, couldn't you have taught me any other way? Maybe but maybe not. So we can't despise the hard times. We can't despise the lessons. How, now, I know there's a few of you, but how many just love to go to school? Yeah, there's a few of you. The rest of us, yeah, mm-hmm. We went because we had to. But I'm telling you what, I sure am glad I know how to read. You know, I am sure glad. I am even glad mom got the fly swatter after me to practice the piano. (laughs) And she isn't here to defend herself. (laughs) But she would just get that little fly swatter, and she said, now, honey, you need to sit down and practice your piano. I'm like, oh, that's the squish bugs, mom. But anyway, it worked because I practiced piano. And I hated practicing piano. Matter of fact, I hated piano lessons. (laughs) Oh, I am so glad that I had piano lessons. I am so glad that mom got the fly swatter out and made me practice. Wasn't really a happy time then, but it produced something in my life that I enjoy now. Sometimes we go through things that may not be happy at the moment, but what it produces is good. So, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> so we need to just put a smile on it smile at the fly swatter or the sister sandpaper or whatever and say, God, whatever you're doing in me, do it. I give myself to you. Joy is not in things. Joy is in us. It's not in what you have or what you don't have. It's in us. So discover joy in the middle of challenges because it is a matter of perspective. 
I, I think I've told this before, but I, I love this story. An elderly lady was well known for her faith and her boldness and talking about it. And she would stand at the front porch and say, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, she was just a happy little gal. And next door to her lived an atheist who would get so angry at her proclamations, he would shout, there ain't no Lord. <laughs> well, hard times set in for the elderly lady, and she prayed for God to send her some assistance. So she stood on the front porch and she praised, praise the Lord. God, I need food. I am having a hard time. Please, Lord, send me some food. Well, the next morning, the lady went out on the porch and noted a large bag of groceries and shouted, praise the Lord. And the neighbor jumped out from behind the bush and said, now, I told you there wasn't no Lord. I brought them groceries. God didn't do it. <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? The lady started jumping up and down and clapping her hands and said, Praise the Lord. He not only sent me groceries, but he made the devil pay for them. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I tell you what, there was nothing that could get that little lady down. God sent her those groceries. Then a 92, I love this one. This, this, this story really illustrates to me a matter of perspective of what, how we should live our lives. A 92-year-old man, uh, short, well-presented, uh, who took great care of his appearance, was moving into an old people's home one day. His wife of 70 years had recently died, and he was uh, obliged to leave his home. After waiting several hours in the retirement home lobby, he gently smiled as I told him his room was ready. As he slowly walked to the elevator using his cane, I described his small room to him, including the sheet that hung at the window, which served as a curtain. I like it very much, he said, with enthusiasm of an eight-year-old boy who had just been given a new puppy. Sir, you haven't seen your room yet. Hang on a moment. We're almost there. Oh, that has nothing to do with it, ma'am. Happiness is something I choose in advance. Whether or not I like the room really doesn't depend on the furniture or the decor. Rather, it depends on how I decide to look at it. It is already decided in my mind that I'm going to like my room. It is a, a decision I make every morning when I wake up. I can choose. I can spend my day in bed enumerating all the difficulties that I have with the parts of my body that don't work very well. Or I can get up and give thanks to heaven for those parts that still are working. Every day is a gift, and as long as I can open my eyes, I will focus on the new day and all the happy memories that I have made during my life. Oh, age is just kind of like a bank account. You withdraw in later life what you have deposited along the way. Isn't that awesome? I'm going to deposit joy, aren't you? I'm going to deposit those things that when I... <laughs> I'm looking at you young ones when I get old. <laughs> I'm there, okay? But when I get older, when I look at, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pull those things out. What God has done in my life. What amazing, miraculous things he has done in our church. We can choose. We can choose to look at the hard times or the bad times. Or we can choose to look at what God has done. Lastly, abide in his joy. John 15, 11, I have told you this so that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be complete. Thank you, Robert. Hallelujah. Your joy can be complete. It means it abides, it dwells in you, it lives in you. It's not an occasional visitor who comes when things are going good. It lives, it abides in you. Elijah had done some amazing, awesome things for God. And he had uh, confront, confronted Ahab and defeated the, uh, the, the gods of Baal. At the height of his ministry, out of the fear of Jezre uh, Jezebel, he ran into the wilderness and he fell into a suicidal depression. This is a character in the Bible that we look at and we know is a mighty man of God. However, God restored him and recommissioned him to finish his ministry. I have a, a feeling as I read this that he was not living at that moment in joy. Something had stole his joy. Don't you? 
And, and, and I, I say that, I'm not picking on Elijah, but I'm saying if it can happen to a man of God like that, where he could get to a place where he could get uh, suicidal and be so depressed, we need to take note, don't we? So I, I, I'm thinking about some things that even godly people need to watch so that we don't lose our joy. Number one, we may lose our joy if our outflow ex exceeds our intake. Okay? You hear what I'm saying? I got this. I'm going to, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm doing for God, I'm doing for God, but I'm telling you there's a time when you have to be fed. There's a time when you have to go away and you have to spend personal time one-on-one -on -one with God. You have to get in the Word and you have to see what He says for you. And if we don't take that time just working, 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 we're going to lose our joy. Does that make sense? So it's a caution to us that our uh, intake, we watch... Uh, let me see how I said that. We lose our joy when our outflow, that our outflow does not exceed our intake, intake of the word, intake of prayer, intake of time with God. Number two, when our talk exceeds our walk. Okay? We have to be careful with that. When our mouth is proclaiming certain things, but our walk is not walking it out. Then, then the the joy is not going to be there because you're going to be looking over your shoulder or driving in the rear view. You know, we have to walk out what we talk. Number three, when we become wonder junkies. He did not find God in the wind or the earthquake or the fire, but in the still, small voice. I love when God shows up and shows out. I absolutely love when the power of the Holy Spirit is very strong, and in no way am I saying that we don't need that. We need that. I think that's, as a, a father, uh, as we love to give our children good gifts, so does our father love to lavish on us, and I believe we should believe for that every time we meet, but that's not the goal. The goal is to get closer to him, the goal is to, to unite with him in our worship. And I think the more we do that, the more those, it says signs and wonders, what? Follow. They follow. It's not this. I, I, I look at a wonder junkie as like, wow, that is so cool. I'm going to go there because that is happening over there. But I think the true, the really dedicated Christian is one who is seeking God with all his heart. Revival will start in our church when we are seeking God, when we're sorry for what we have done in our in, in sin, and then when we repent, and then when we get up and we worship, and we start seeking God's face, and we start saying, now, today, God, today I worship you, no matter what's going on, then revival will happen. And I tell you, when revival happens, then signs and wonders are going to follow me, and I'm not going to have to go looking for them. Does that make sense? I believe, I believe God wants to shower his gifts on us. But that's not the main agenda. The main agenda is following him with our whole heart with the joy of the Lord. Then four, when we are exhausted. You ever been at that place where you're just like wore out? You have nothing left. I, I don't even remember who said this. Brian, you may remember, but somebody told us, sometimes when you are exhausted, the most spiritual thing you can do is sleep or rest. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you that every Sunday morning at 1030, that's your spiritual you know, duty. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I am saying that sometimes, you know, we, we feel like, you know, we have to be superhuman and we have to do everything and do everything and do everything. And sometimes God says, stop. Uh, hey, lay down the cell phone. Hello? Did that kind of hurt? You know, sometimes we have to sit down, lay down, uh, sit down the cell phone, put it aside because you know what? God's on duty 24 seven. And if we don't pick it up, Somebody else will. Hallelujah. I'm serious. Sometimes that needs to happen. And number five, when we feel all alone, be careful to not view yourself as the only spiritual one when others do not share your passion or your call. 
Just get excited about your own passion. Don't make everybody else think the way you do. Do exactly like you do. Just be excited about what God has asked you to do, what he has birthed in you. Can you give me one last hallelujah? I'm going to call the, the praise band back, and I want to ask you some questions as, as they make their way back. <clears throat> when is the last time you were just caught away with the joy of the Lord, what the, with what the joy of the Lord had done for you? I mean, just absolutely blown away by what the joy, with joy for what the Lord was doing in your life. I mean, I mean check it out. If you're just checking off a list because you're doing the right things, is that enough? When is the last time you said, I love this, like that little girl, God, I love you. I mean, with, with abandon, just like that little girl in the video. I love that. I love that. God, I love you. I love you. Bottom line. Bottom line. Have you ever really soaked in the fact that you are eternally his? Just let it sink in. All kinds of things can happen, but I'm his. I'm his. Come on, I'm his. Thank you, Lord. That should light your fire. I am, amen, hallelujah, I'm his. <laughs> Have you been able to see God's perspective of your life and its events and just trust him even when you don't see the whole picture? God, I trust you. You're not going to lead me astray. I trust you. And the last one, are, are, you, are you up and down? Are you daily living in joy? And do you have your feet firmly planted? just going to ask you to take inventory as we think about these things. If you'd stand with me, take inventory. And, and I just want you to think about your own life. And if somebody were to come around you, would they know just by being around you, something's different. They're a Christian. Something's different because they're going through some really hard junk and they still have joy. You may not be happy, but you still have joy. Would that be said? Would that be said about you, about me? But you know what? You cannot, there is no way that you can live every day with joy without Jesus. It's just not possible. So I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes bow your heads and I just want you to think about that really strong if you're really sick and tired of being sick and tired really tired of just putting one foot in front of the other but you're ready even if the circumstances are yucky to have the foundation that Jesus is in your life and it's all going to be okay if you've never received him as your personal Savior. You never started a relationship with Him. Or maybe you have and you've turned your back and you said, yeah, just give up. But today you say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready for some joy in my life. I'm ready for you, Jesus, because you are joy. If you want that today, I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand. That today is your day. Where you want joy, where you want Jesus in your heart. Okay, I see that. I see those. And I'm just going to ask all of us to pray together as these have lifted their hands. As we say all the time, these words are not magic, but I tell you what you say in your heart is powerful. So when you speak these words from your heart, it's the beginning of a relationship. It's the beginning of a relationship. So would you pray with me? Dear Father, I come to you today, come to you today, and I tell you, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired, I'm sick and tired. I want you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. The joy, the joy, my joy, my joy, to come into my life, to come into my life.
I repent of my sins. I repent of my sins. And I move forward with you. And I move forward with I you. I thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross. And shedding your blood. And shedding your blood. So that I could live in so, joy. So that I could live in joy. So I receive you today as my so Savior. I see you today. And I commit to walking in joy. I commit to walking in joy. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we just rejoice together and we sing to the good, good Father. <laughs>